is 75 to life. That in uh, New York, different uh, states and the feds have different sentencing structure, but in New York, 75, that is the minimum. This, it's not like they say 75 and you go to the board in 20 years. My first chance for parole is 2056. I got involved with uh, both Weatherman and then what became the Weather Underground back when we formed in 69 and 70. And we formed in the cauldron of uh, intense struggle against the war in Vietnam and racism at a time when the Black Panthers, who were leading force in the black struggle that we identified with, were getting cut down and assassinated at a time when uh, we were highly charged and moved by pictures of children in Vietnam getting made calm, massive demonstrations that didn't stop the war. In that context, we came out of uh, the radical student movement, at that time predominantly white, because students were a democratic society. In the context of seeing a lot of the people who inspired us and who had led the protests getting assassinated or putting in, put in prison, and a war that was so brutal and wouldn't stop, a small section of what was the broad student movement decided we had to be in a position to carry out illegal forms of struggle against the government. I had been sort of awakened already that something was wrong about the civil rights movement. See, in terms of my early consciousness, I had never been exposed to the left or heard of the left. I believed that America was a democracy, and I took that really seriously. And I, I, didn't, I never cut the wink that it's a democracy for some people, not for other people, and I fervently believed it. And then I saw with the opening of the civil rights movement that uh, certain people were denied any opportunity or right to vote or anything. That was like, I went off, you could say, because I believed in the mist. But I still assumed that America stood for democracy abroad. What happened when I was still in high school, my best friend in high school had an exchange student from Vietnam living with him. She wasn't a communist, she was from an aristocratic family. But she let us know that in Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh was considered the George Washington of Vietnam, that they were the ones who fought for independence. And the so-called regime and self-government in South Vietnam had been imposed by the United States as a continuation of French colonialism. So before, this is before the bombing of North Vietnam, where the uh, US involvement in Vietnam became a public issue. We're talking about 1961, I was 16. I wrote an uh, article for my high school paper saying the United States was supporting the wrong side of Vietnam was going to lead to a major civil war, and it was wrong. But at that time, that was considered like being crazy, ultra. You did it in 1961, you did not criticize the US foreign policy. That was considered bipartisan, you always supported it. Uh, so that was considered pretty far out there. I think in light of history, what developed was a pretty moderate and prudent assessment of what was going on. The civil rights movement opened up. Hi, good evening, Hi. hello, thanks for being here. Um, I'm Naomi Jaffe, and um, we're, <coughs> we're going to celebrate the publication of Love and Struggle, which is a memoir by, David, by political prisoner David Gilbert. Um, I guess first I want to say thanks to Leslie and Teresa and Nate for having this program here, and to you all for coming. And um, what we're going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a few words to introduce you to David a little bit, to get to know David a little bit. And then we have these, this set of wonderful panelists who are going to um, read a bit from David's book, talk a little bit about how it resonates with them. Um, and then we're going to ask you to say a few words, actually. The reason that David wrote this book is that, um, is that young people asked him about the history of that period of the 60s and 70s and early 80s and what the lessons were. And, um, and he really wrote it not, he's a pretty modest guy, he wrote it not really to talk about himself but to share those lessons. Um, when we did this book event 
for David's book, um, where I live in Troy, one of the young women that I work with said, it feels to me like this book is a letter from David to me saying, you have a right to this history, you have a right to this legacy, you have a right to be part of this conversation. And um, that's true of the younger generation, it's true of all of us. We have a right to be part of each other's legacy and history. And, uh, and we need it. We need to do it in order to build the movement for liberation. So, um, <clears throat> so we're going to try for tonight to be part of that conversation. And so when you listen to the things that people are saying, to what the panelists are going to say about the book, um, listen with an ear to what resonates for you, what's relevant to your work, um, and listen with the idea that you're going to be part of this conversation in, in 20 minutes. So, <laughs> so what I'm going to do as people talk, if there are particular themes and issues, I'll just jot them down to jog your memory so that you can be part of the conversation. That's the idea. The idea is to have a conversation together. The idea is to use each other's experiences to build a movement for justice. So I'm going to start by introducing you to David. And after I introduce you to David, I'm going to introduce you to the panelists. Um, that was David, as you can guess. David Gilbert is a, um, is a political prisoner. Um, what we mean by a political prisoner, the US says that it doesn't have any political prisoners, so they don't admit to political prisoners. But what political prisoners supporters mean by a political prisoner is someone who is serving time or has served time um, for actions in resistance to or in challenge to an unjust system. Um, and there are lots of political prisoners. In fact, tonight's panel is particularly rich in political prisoner supporters. Um, all of our panelists have a real uh, intense history of being supporters of political prisoners. And so they may say a bit about their own work in support of political prisoners as well. Can, you ever, can, can everybody hear me all right? Am I talking loud enough? If I stop talking loud enough, yell at me and tell me to talk louder back there, okay? <laughs> gotcha. Um, David, the, David is um, serving, as he said, a 75 life sentence in uh, New York's Max A prisons. Uh, he's in his 30, a little over 30th year of that sentence. He's been in prison for 30 years. Um, and he went to prison as a result of being, uh, he was a white ally who participated in an action by the Black Liberation Army, which was um, a, a clandestine armed offshoot of the Black Panther Party. This was in 1981. The Black Liberation Army had done a number of actions. One of them was the freeing of um, Asada Shakur, who was one of the, <laughs> uh, really the, a, a central leader of the Black Panthers and in general of black nationalist struggle in those days. And she was in prison, they freed her, and she um, made her way to Cuba where she is living today in exile. Um, this is 40 years later, almost 40 years later. Um, and the Black Liberation Army also did what they called expropriations, armed robberies, to support the building of a clandestine um, resistance movement. The revolution is not funded by the Ford Foundation, and it's not funded by the government. So revolutionaries have to find ways of financing. You have to you have to build an infrastructure. And um, at that time, the Black Liberation Army had done a number of those on robberies without firing a shot, without harming anyone. Um, this one went wrong um, in very tragic ways. A Briggs guard and two police officers were killed, and a number of um, Black Liberation Army members and supporters got long prison terms. Uh, nobody has any idea, actually, who did those shootings. There was no evidence, one way or another. I mean, somebody shot those people, but nobody really. There was there were there was no credible witness evidence as to who did any of the shootings. David um, was unarmed, did not clearly did not shoot anyone. In New York, if you are part of any kind of a um, crime in which people are killed, you receive the same, the same conviction and the same sentence 
as if you had pulled the trigger. So David's sentence is a three consecutive 25 to life terms for, um, uh, for an activity in which he didn't actually harm anyone. Um, so, oh, what I wanted to say about David, and I wanted to say a word about my history with David. I know it's here somewhere. Just to get my, the order here right. I met David in 1967. We were both fiery young students in New York, and um, we participated in founding New School SDS, and we participated in the Columbia strike, and um, lots of militant Vietnam, anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. We had an a intense but brief romantic relationship, and after the, uh, then after that, we, we were comrades and we worked together on and off for many years. Um, but, but not, and then I, we were in SDS together and then in the Weather Underground together. But we didn't really work all that closely together really in the years uh, after um, we were in New York. I became very involved in the women's liberation movement at the, in the late 60s and early 70s. And, um, and so I got past my heartbreak and started to do a lot. There was a lot of interesting work, which I won't talk about tonight. Um, and so when the weather underground broke up in the late 70s, 78, 79, um, I went back to the try to build a life for myself, and I had no idea where David was, actually. And I hadn't really, when I, I was, no, I was at, I wasn't in New York State, I was in the Midwest, and then the Brinks robbery happened, and those arrests happened in 1981. I read about them in the newspaper, just like everybody else. And um, a little while after that, I had, I had a baby, I moved back to New York State. Um, I read about it in the newspaper, I thought it was, I was shocked that, uh, when, they, when David was sentenced to the 75 to life, which was in 1983. I was obviously pretty horrified. Um, but I hadn't been in touch with him in years, and I didn't, I didn't really see that it had a whole lot to do with me, actually. And I sort of paid attention, but not that close attention. And it was a few years I was raising, I, was, I had a baby, I was trying to rebuild a life of, I had surfaced from the underground for years, I was trying to rebuild a non-clandestine life, and so I didn't pay all that much attention. And one day, um, and I was living in upstate New York, and he was in prison in Dannemora, which is up, up, upstate New York. <laughs> and <laughs> um, one day I ran into a mutual friend, Jeff Jones, and he said, well, you know, Dave was asking for you. Wondered how you were, and you could write to him. And I had, at that moment, I had to face the level of terror and distancing and denial that I was in about what it meant to me to have a comrade that was sentenced to 75 to life, and how <coughs> totally it could have been me, and how this whole thing about how it wasn't that I wasn't that involved was a, a complete denial. And, the moral of this story really is that um, there's a real temptation for us with prisoners and in general with people who face huge obstacles in life to to want to say that couldn't it couldn't be me I would have known better I, I, I'm smarter than that it couldn't happen to me because it's scary that really is terrifying and so um, so I realized that it did have everything to do with me and um, and I wrote to David and. Um, we, that was in 1988, and I, we've been very close friends ever since I visit once a month, and have been part of a, a support structure for him. And I guess what I want to say about that is that what helps, first of all, the reason that, that all that denial and distancing, it's not healthy for you. It doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem of fear. This is a scary time. We are scared. It, doesn't help to not admit that. We live in a really scary world. And it seems to me that part of the way that we deal with that is by, um, 
is by resistance and by supporting people in resistance. And that's been how David has survived, actually, all those years in prison. Um, David's survival and the survival of our political prisoners, the way that, they, that, they, that their spirits have survived, um, is really part of the antidote to that fear. Um, David says that the way that he survived is, by, um, is through love, through the love that he has for the people in his life and that they have for him. And through, the, um, and through a spirit, <coughs> through remaining principles, and through non surrender that book that, that book of his that says no surrender back there on the table. No surrender didn't, wasn't, it wasn't meant to be military. It meant that you don't surrender your spirit of resistance and your spirit of uh, love for liberation and love for people. Um, and David has, and our other political prisoners too, have managed to survive some of the worst that this system has to offer by being principled and loving and not surrendering your spirit. So that's sort of the story of me and David. So we've, I've been visiting now for well over, probably about 24 years of the 30 that he's been in prison. Um, and there's lots to say about being prison visitors, but we won't say that tonight. So it's part of the oppression. Part of the oppression of prison is the way that families and friends um, are, are made to suffer. As we all we do, we do that time together. Every many many of us here know that that, that we, do, we do the time together. Um, not in the same way, but but we do do it. So um, there's one or two. One more thing, really, that I want to say about what I've learned from David. And it's sort of maybe the central lesson. There's lots of lessons in the book, but I want to tell this one because it's my favorite story from the book. And because I think it exemplifies what how, to, how to learn what lessons. When David was at Columbia, I'm not going to read it, i just tell you the story because I know it by heart. Um, when he was a young student at Columbia in the 60s, um, as, as he said in the film, he came off full of idealism and wanted, thought things could be reformed. And one of the programs that they had at Columbia was uh, that the students went into Harlem to tutor young black kids. And Columbia students were predominantly white, white middle and upper class young people. So they went into Harlem to tutor these black kids. And um, this was during the years of the Vietnam War, and David was also involved in the Vietnam, forming a Vietnam anti-war committee on campus. Um, he was very active in the anti-war work. And so when, um, when the U.S. started bombing North Vietnam, <coughs> David was distraught. And it happened that that day he was going into Harlem to tutor this kid that he was tutoring regularly. And he walks into the house, and the kid's mother looks at his face and says, could see that something's really wrong, and says to him, Dave, what's the matter? You look really upset. And he said, oh my god, our country is bombing people on the other side of the world for no reason. And this woman had never heard of Vietnam. She says to him, bombing people on the other side of the world for no reason? It must be colored people live there. <laughs> and that connection, which he had not been able to make himself, he was doing these two kinds of work. And this person immediately saw the connection because she lived it. And she knew it. And of course, that was the sort of fundamental connection which Malcolm X started to make for us later. The connection, and that David in the book goes from this experience of what he learned from this woman in Harlem to what he learned from Malcolm X, which is the, connect which is the connectedness of people in resistance and also the connectedness of the system's oppression. Um, and I, I give that as the one example because if, because I think in any period, what the most, the most targeted people have the most comprehensive analysis of the system. You get from the bottom, you get the most holistic view. Of a, of, a, of a system as a system of connections among the whole system, among them. And David in the book 
talks about how to learn that from the people who are most targeted by the system. So that's one of the, that's one of the key lessons to learn the book. So what I'd like to do now is introduce you to all the panelists. Sheila, can you come and see too?